All right. This morning we are wrapping up a series that we've been in for four weeks now. This is the fourth week in the series called Relation Slips, where we're trying to identify the things that cause our relationships to stumble, to fail, and to see what we can do about those, to avoid those relation slips, and to live into how we build the strongest possible relationships, because all of life is about relationship. Everything about life is how we relate to uh, the people we live with, you know, if it's, if it's not just us, we have a family, we have a spouse, kids, whatever that might be. Um, if, if, no matter if we're employed, it's about relationships because we're working with people. Uh, we have neighbors, uh, we interact with strangers all the time. All of life is about relationships. All of life is about relationship with God, too. God is, is present with us everywhere. We're called to be in relationship with God. So it's important that we get this right. And there's so many re- potential relation slips out there, we've got to make sure that we avoid those. So what we've been looking at in this series are some of the one another's. And I'll remind you, there are 54 one another's in the Bible. And we've looked at three of those so far, which were love one another, encourage one another, and respect one another. And today, we're going to look at one of the one another's I think is probably the most important. It's certainly foundational to the faith of Christianity, and that is to forgive one another. So, here's what I want to encourage you to do. Jot some notes down. There'll be some things today you're like, all right, I want to remember that, or I want to make sure I lock that in. Second thing is, be in the Word. And so we provide a a study guide for you to do that. There's a more detailed, it's in your program, there's a more detailed study guide online if you want to use that. The idea is to be in, in Scripture, listening for God's voice, seeing how God might speak to you individually. And I do the same thing every day. It's a part of my It's a part of my life, but open the book for yourself. Don't take my word for it. So forgiveness. If we're going to start with forgiveness, let's look at a passage of Scripture that the Apostle Paul, the guy our church is named after, let's let's look at a passage that he gives us where he's just telling us simply about forgiving one another. This comes from the book of Ephesians. So he says, be kind and compassionate to one another. Here it is. Forgiving one another, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Why is this so important? Um, Well, Besides the fact that it's the foundation of Christianity, it is what, what ultimately makes relationships work. Without forgiveness, relationships crash and burn. Relationships fail miserably without forgiveness. So every week we've been looking at, at, uh, at one of the one another's. We've been looking at a particular relation slip. Here's today's relation slip. It's this. I don't need to forgive Forgiveness is about them saying sorry, and I just got to tell you, you will slip and you will fall on this one every single time. Forgiveness. So, um, let's talk about forgiveness, and let's get at it this way. Do you know what the second most, um, what's the right word, second most recognizable symbol on the planet is? The second most. It's the Coca-Cola logo. Every continent, there's, there, on every, every little nook and corner and cranny of the world, you'll find Coca-Cola. That's the second most recognizable symbol in the, in the world. The first most recognizable symbol is the cross. The cross of Jesus is a, a symbol, and it's a symbol that's the, the most recognized, and it's a symbol of a lot of different things. But today I want to focus on one part of that symbolism, and that is forgiveness, obviously. No relationship can survive without it. And to get us thinking about this, I want to ask you a question, sort of an obvious question. Um, Has there ever been a time in your life where somebody has wronged you? Has there ever been a time in your life when someone hurt you, lied to you, lied about you, undermined you, did some damage to some part of your life, stole something from you? I don't know. It could be anything. Is there there a time when that has happened to you? And I know the answer is yes. Why? Why? Because being wronged is a universal human experience. It happens to everybody at some point. It's a universal human experience. And here's the thing. When it happened to you, when that wrong happened to you, it shaped you. And not only did the wrong, hap- when it happened to you, shape you, how you reacted to that wrong shaped you. And there are a variety of ways that you can react to a wrong. If you reacted with, with um, anger, if you reacted with revenge and holding a grudge, that shaped you in a particular way. So let's talk about grudges for a minute. Let's be brutally honest for, for a second here. Um, 
When, when you have a grudge, isn't it kind of a uh, guilty pleasure? One of life's guilty pleasures is holding a grudge against somebody. I mean, doesn't it feel kind of good? I mean, if you, if you are in a, the right setting, you can bring that grudge out and display it and kind of be vindicated by that and maybe generate some pity from some folks when you, when you bring that grudge out. Because what they did was so wrong and holding that grudge can feel so right. Um, and one of the things we like to do when we hold a grudge is we like to um, kind of fantasize about what we would do if we could confront the person that we have the grudge against. Maybe I'm totally wrong in this, but do we do this? Fantasize about the, you know, hey, I can't wait to be that. And we really don't want to do this, but we kind of play it off in our heads, you know, like, gosh, I can't wait to be face to face with them and tell them what I really think about them. Tell them how they really hurt me. You know, really make them feel the burn so that I see their lip quiver just a little bit and that tear kind of go down the side of their face. We can play that over and over again because we like there's a part of us that, that likes to hold that grudge. But let's confront that. Holding a grudge may feel good, but does it really work? I'm skeptical. And the reason I'm skeptical is because, well, because some of you have been holding a grudge for a long, long, long time now. And the fact that you've been holding a grudge for a long time now, to me, means that holding a grudge just doesn't work. Some of us make present-day decisions based on something that happened to us a long time ago, or maybe not that long ago, we make present day decisions based on something that happened a long time ago, and we end up making poor decisions because of that, if we're holding a grudge. That lets me know that, well, holding a grudge just doesn't work. Some of us literally have insomnia because, you know, we have bags under our eyes, even though we get an extra hour of sleep because daylight savings time has ended, we, we still, we don't sleep well because we're rehashing what was done to us years ago. Over and over, replaying it over and over, fantasizing about that confrontation over and over and over again. Some of us have to use z Quill or Ambien or Jack Daniels in order just to calm down our, our, our minds enough to get some sleep. So, does holding a grudge really work? I don't think so. See, here's the sinister thing about a grudge. This is going to freak some of you out. The longer you hold a grudge, the longer the grudge has hold of you. Sort of like holding a boa constrictor. Yeah. Think about it. You know, some people buy boa constrictors as little bitty pets, and they grow up, and they get bigger. And yeah, for a while you can hold that, hold that pet, but after a while, it's going to start holding you and constricting you and squeezing the life out of you. That's what a grudge will do. So here's the alternative. We can take that picture down. Nobody wants to see that anymore. <laughs> if you choose God's way, which we're going to talk about here in a minute, what God can do is start to loosen the grip of the grudge. What God can do is start breaking the chains that chain us to our past so that you can actually fully embrace what God has in store for your present and what God has in store for your future. This is the power of forgiveness, and it is a very, very powerful thing. So that takes us to the most recognizable symbol in the world again, the cross. Because uh, we, need to, we need to remember a couple things. You, you probably know this, but we need to be reminded of this. Um, back in Jesus' time, the Romans in the first century, they controlled that part of the world in the way that they often put criminals to death. Uh, these were Gentile criminals, uh, mostly, uh, uh, and some of the Jews were put to death on a cross. And we often think of a cross as something that's uh, kind of off in the distance, on a hill, far away. But most of the time, the Romans crucified the criminals right next to busy highways because they wanted people to see. They didn't want them far away. And crosses were not way up high in the air. They were just, the, the, the person who was crucified, their feet were just inches off the ground. Why? Well, again, the Romans wanted people to be close to those being crucified. They wanted to be, uh, have them at almost eye level because Rome was saying, you know, we caught this guy doing something wrong. Don't you get caught. Don't do something wrong or you will end up here just like him. I mean, the, the, the message was submit to Rome. And it was a powerful and memorable message for anybody that saw a crucifixion. But the day that Jesus was crucified, Rome wasn't the only one sending a message. God was sending a message. Powerful 
a message more powerful than the message Rome was sending. God's message was this, come face to face with the fact that all of us have sinned, all of us have fallen short. Come, even while you're still a sinner, and understand that Jesus died for you in your sin so that you could experience God's forgiveness. And the reason that's so important to picture is because in a very real sense, you were there that day when Jesus was crucified. We all were there. The the cross is personal. The cross means that no matter what you've done, what Jesus has done on the cross trumps that. No matter what you've done, there's there's no sin that you could commit that, that Jesus' death on the cross doesn't cover that sin. And what that means for you is that as God looks at you, what He sees from the reality of the cross, when you accept the reality of the cross, God looks at you and and says, forgiven. Forgiven. Holy. Righteous. My son. My daughter. Forgiven. Because of the cross. So God wants you to personally experience that forgiveness. This is important for us to get this part before we move on to the next part, right? He he wants you to personally experience that forgiveness, but God does not want that forgiveness to get trapped inside of you and me. And this is so important. God's grace and forgiveness is meant to come to us, but then God's grace and forgiveness is meant to go out through us into the lives of other people around us. It's the foundation of all relationships. When you understand the cross, here's what, what's, what happens. And this is a phrase we've used around here a number of times, and it's important that we get it locked in, and that is that forgiven people forgive people. Forgiven people forgive people. And that's how we avoid this relation slip. Forgiven people forgive people. And that act of forgiveness begins to break the grip of the grudge, and, and we understand how, how powerful forgiveness is, how aggressive it is, because it breaks the chain of our past, frees us to live into the future. So, we've got to accept that part, our own forgiveness, that God's grace comes to us and is meant to go out through us. How do we apply that in the lives of other people? How do we practice forgiveness? And that leads us to another scripture. We're going to be looking at this. This is a Romans chapter 12. And the Apostle Paul wrote these words to these, these new Christians, this young church, this very, very uh, fledgling congregation in the city of Rome. And he starts by saying this in chapter 12. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. <clears throat> and this is really important. Paul is, is making it clear that what that person did to you is evil. He's not at all saying, oh, just it's, it's nothing. Just let it slide. It's no big deal. No, Paul's saying it was bad. It was evil. But Paul's telling us to choose wisely how we respond to that evil. He goes on. He says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. And this is important. Paul says live at peace with everyone. He doesn't say live in partnership with everyone. There's a difference. And and, and I think, uh, you know, you look at this in terms of business. If if you're in a business relationship with someone and and they they steal from you, they undermine that, that business relationship you do not have you may have to exit that person out of the partnership. You may have to exit yourself out of that partnership, but you do so as as peacefully as possible. Because living at peace does not mean you have to live in partnership. You know, we don't have to be as Christians, we don't have to be in a place where okay, you hurt me, just keep on hurting me. Just keep on hurting me. That's what it means to be a Christian. No. We have to sometimes exit that relationship, but we do so with as much peace as we possibly can. That's what Paul's getting at. And then he goes on, he says, Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it's written, it's mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. So, based on this verse, whose job is it to avenge you when you've been wronged? Whose job is it? God's job. And when you, when you take on the, the role of getting revenge for yourself, whose job are you doing? God's job. And are you very good at doing God's job? I'm not. Not at all. We do a terrible job at doing God's job. Paul's saying, trust God on this. He'll do a better job of of making sure that things end up the way they need to end up. 
And in, in recognizing that, I think there's real freedom there. And then Paul quotes from Proverbs. He says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Now, you got to love Paul when he's talking about this here because he's saying, leave the vengeance to God, but there's one little bit of vengeance that you get to have. And it's by being kind to people who hurt us, by showing them the last thing they're going to expect. It's like dumping a bucket of white hot charcoal on their heads. Wow. Now, before you get too excited about that form of revenge, you need to know that that's just an ancient expression about shaming uh, someone. And, and here's the thing, too. It's not that Paul is saying, in fact, he's saying the opposite. He, he's not saying you should take into your own hands the shame of someone else and shame them. No. His idea is that in being kind to somebody in helping someone who has hurt you, that they'll experience within their, you know, their own mind, their own, their own way of looking at it, they'll experience a shame that actually changes them. But here's the bottom line. Kindness is the only form of vengeance we're allowed if we follow Jesus. Kindness is the only form of vengeance <clears throat> we're allowed. We let the justice of God to play out. And we let the justice of the law of the land play out as well. And then Paul sums it up this way. He says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So when somebody wrongs you, you got two choices. Um, If you hold on to hate, if you hold on to unforgiveness, to that grudge, you are going to be overcome by evil. But when you live out forgiveness, you find freedom. You break the grip of the grudge. So let me break this down. For those of you that are a little more linear in how you think, let's, let's lay this out. Paul's got a clear four-part forgiveness process here. We've touched on this before, but it's a good reminder. Step one, embrace God's forgiveness of yourself. Embrace that. No, no matter what you've done, God's forgiveness is real for you. The world's most recognizable symbol, the cross, is a marker for you that you are forgiven. And then, um, step two, forgiven people forgive people. And by the way, this isn't just a suggestion. This is a command from Jesus, our Lord. Here's what he said one day. He said, if you forgive others when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, listen, your Father will not forgive your sins. Man, does it get any clearer than that? You and I, we get to choose. And that leads to step three, let God avenge you. Trust God to do what he needs to do to settle the score. And then, step four, overcome evil with good. You can't make a bad thing done to you better by doing more bad things. That just feeds the evil. That's why forgiveness works, and that's why grudge holding does not work. Now, you may be thinking, okay, Aaron, this is all good, but if you knew my story, If you knew what was done to me, um, you'd understand why I can't forgive that particular person. And uh, you know, you're right to a degree. I don't know all your stories, but I know a lot of them. Um, I I know some of the stories that you have shared with me over the years. And over the years, we've had a variety of people share from the stage about forgiveness. People like Jody Ketron. I want to remind you of her story. Jody's a member of St. Paul's, and she actually um, ha- is a certified lay speaker. So she, uh, probably one or two Sundays a month, she is going out to some of the other churches, smaller churches around here, and she's speaking. She's preaching out there. Um, she's quite a lady. But a big part of her story is that in 2007, her daughter, Tammy Mahan, and her granddaughter, Faith Ann, were murdered by Tammy's boyfriend. Can you imagine the grief? of losing your daughter and your granddaughter so horrifically. I've talked to Jody a number of times about that, about how do you react when you hear something like that? And she said, you know, you're, you react with disbelief and then anger and then rage. They caught the murderer, a man, his name is Mark Vincent. They caught him. He was given two life sentences with no possibility of parole. 
And um, at his sentencing hearing, Jody was allowed to read a statement. The family was there when, when Mark was sentenced. And in that statement, she, she expressed her pain. She talked about her grief. But she also talked about forgiveness. And I asked her, I said, Jody, how, how are you able to forgive this guy that took so much from your family? And she said, well, first of all, my faith prepared me to forgive. And then she said, um, I, I knew this, that if I didn't forgive him, then, then he would just keep hurting my family. I thought that was so incredibly wise. She said that she sought justice, you know, that, that she did seek justice, but in her letter she said, I want, I want to seek justice but not revenge. And then she told me that forgiving him was, was important so that she and her family could move on with their lives. In the courtroom that day, um, when the murderer was sentenced, the judge looked at him and said, you're what is wrong with society. And then the judge turned to Jody and, and her family and said, you are what is right. Why? Forgiveness. I think of the men and women over the years who've told me how they were sexually abused as children. The trauma, the chaos, the brokenness and loss that they faced. And how forgiving the offender was a crucial part of their healing, their ability to move on that hatred kept them shackled in the past. In, in all these cases, people sought justice, and I think that is what we do. We seek justice for what was done to them, but they also realized that vengeance and unforgiveness, that carrying, that carrying hatred and grudges only made the pain worse and last longer. The forgiveness was the real healer. I've also heard people's stories who have not chosen to forgive. I've heard those stories too. And, and, and I've seen them become, I don't know the best way to put this, they become slaves to hate. I've noticed some of them change physically, like they become hunched over, curled in on themselves in, in, in that unforgiveness. Because I, I really do believe hatred is toxic. So, so, you know, no, I don't know your specific story. I, I don't. But I do know the freeing power of forgiveness and the toxic power of holding on to hurt and hate. I know that. Let's go back to the most recognizable symbol in the, on the world. So Jesus hung on a cross. He died there for the innocent and the guilty alike. And he hung on the cross. He said this, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing what he said. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. Who's the them that he's forgiving? Some of it's pretty obvious. The them is the Roman soldiers who actually drove the spikes through his wrists and through his feet. Forgive them, Lord. They don't know what they're doing. I think the them is also it's the religious leaders. They're the ones that are kind of standing there mocking Jesus, kind of grinning the fact they finally got him. They're the ones that orchestrated his death. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I think part of the them is Pontius Pilate, the governor of that area. He's back in his palace. He was supposed to uphold Roman justice, but he didn't. He just kind of gave in to a populist cry of crucifying Jesus. Father, forgive them. Is there anybody else in that them? You know, there's a... There's a tradition in Christianity, a long-standing tradition, where when Jesus says, Father, forgive them, He isn't just looking in the present, that Jesus is also looking into the future. And He's looking into the eyes of every human being who would ever be. And, and I picture Him looking through space and looking through time and looking into the eyes of every human being until He comes to me. And He says, Father, forgive Aaron. And what about you? Father, forgive Christopher. Forgive Tom. Father, forgive Paula and Craig. Father, forgive Vance. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Wow. Forgiveness is powerful. We are the them. 
These words for, from Jesus are for you. And they are for me. Knowing that allows God's forgiveness to flow to us. Owning that allows God's forgiveness to flow then what? Through us. And that changes everything. It's the foundation of our faith as we forgive one another. Because forgiven people forgive people. Forgiven people forgive people. The basis of all of life, it's the basis of all relationship. And for today, that's the good news. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's pray. Uh, as, as you are here today, if you, if you want to own this forgiveness, if you want to if you've kind of kept forgiveness at bay, if you've kind of lived with grudges, and if you want to experience the fullness of Jesus, maybe you tell him that today. Maybe you just say something like this. Jesus, I accept your forgiveness of me. Thank you for dying on a cross for me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving me. Please let your forgiveness flow through me. Lord, I don't want to hold any more grudges. I don't want to hold any more hate. I'm going to, be, I'm going to let you be the one that settles the score. Help me to be free. Lord, anybody who's praying prayers like that, just affirm that in them and help them to experience you all the more. In Jesus' name, amen.